Thank you for joining me for another episode of Sam's Tech Stuff. Today we'll be taking a look at the Fuma 2 cooler from Scythe. Scythe had contacted me about doing a review on the newer Fuma 2 cooler that they've released, and after testing it out, I have to say I'm quite impressed with the overall build quality, ease of installation, cooling performance, and the pricing. The heatsink also ticks off all of these boxes while looking sharp with a dark color scheme and its dual fan setup. The Fuma 2 cooler boasts a 15% performance uplift over the older Fuma model. This heatsink features six heat pipes that are six millimeters each, going through both of the towers to maximize cooling performance. There are actually two different fans included in this CPU cooler. There's the standard Case Flex 120 millimeter fan that is 25 millimeters wide. This fan offers a maximum total airflow of 51.17 CFM. This is the fan that you'll see goes in between the two towers in the picture here. The second fan is a much thinner fan at 17 millimeters. This fan offers a maximum output of 33.86 CFM. And this is the fan that you install on the memory side of the cooler. Slate has also, interestingly enough, reversed the airflow for both of the fans. They say that this helps bring more air through the fins to increase the cooling performance. As with the Mugen 5 that I previously reviewed on the channel, the Fuma 2's heatsink towers are offset or slanted from where the base mounts to the motherboard. This is done to maximize the compatibility with RAM in your system. This way you can run the tallest heatsinks in the land on your RAM and basically you can still safely clear the cooler. What's nice is that on the other side of the cooler there's also a cutout and this ensures that the heatsink doesn't hit any tall VRM heatsinks. As for compatibility with this cooler, if you're watching this video, you probably have or will have a compatible system. The Fuma 2 cooler is compatible with pretty much everything from Intel, the older 775s, the 1366 sockets, pretty much all of the 1150 series, the 2011 and the 2066 sockets. In terms of AMD, the cooler supports FM1, FM2, as well as AM2, AM3, and AM4 all right out of the box. So this cooler will pretty much mount to any motherboard. One thing to keep in mind is that the cooler does have a maximum height of 154.5 millimeters. So if your case does not support a CPU cooler that tall, you may want to look at other options, probably something like an AIO. Now that we have the details out of the way, let's look at the CPU temperature testing that I did. For the test system, I'm running an AMD 3600 R5 CPU. It's the non-X variant. I am not manually overclocking. I'm running the auto overclocking and precision boost algorithms. The fan speeds are set to the defaults on this motherboard, which typically peg the fans at 75% to 100% during most tests. The system RAM used in this build is a G-Skill Trident kit running at 3400 MHz CL14. The graphics card is a Gigabyte Aorus 1080 Ti. The entire system is housed in one of my all-time favorite cases, the Corsair Carbide Air 740. This is a large dual chamber case that focuses on optimal air cooling. So you want to keep in mind the type of case that you have when you look at anyone's air cooling reviews. If you have one with cut off airflow or a completely sealed front, then you'll probably be looking at higher on average temperatures than any review out there. First, we'll start with the most popular 3D Mark Time Spy synthetic benchmarks. I took an average of three different runs with time in between for cooling down with the Fuma 2 installed. Looking at the graphs, you can see that for an average game workload, the temperatures will likely be in the mid 50s, slightly higher if your case doesn't have as good of airflow. The highest peak temperatures that I observed were just over 70C, coming in at 71 or 72. For a workload simulating gaming performance, I was quite happy with these results. They are in line with what I would expect for a dual tower cooler like this. During the benchmark, I took an average of all the core speeds and they were pretty much always roughly around 4.1 GHz plus or minus 25 MHz in either direction. 
Moving on, we have the Sam's Tech Stuff Handbrake and Coating Benchmark. This benchmark is one that I just made up in order to test CPUs and coolers. I've been using my Ryzen 2600X build video as the base and re-encoding this from X264 1080p 30fps into a high quality preset 1080p H.265 file. On average, the cores were roughly 70 to 71 degrees Celsius, with a peak temperature between 73 to 74 Celsius. As handbrake is a bit more intensive than a normal gaming workload, I did see the average core speed dip a little bit down to 3.96 GHz, varying by 15 to 25 MHz in either direction. For the temperatures and the type of workload, this is what I would expect on this CPU and the AM4 platform, so I'm happy with these results. And for those of us who still need the absolute worst taste, highest CPU load benchmarks, we have the Prime 95 small FFT portrait test in 10 minute runs. You can see the temperatures were definitely quite a bit higher here than before with an average of 83.6 C on all the cores. The peak temperatures were between 84 and 85. And just to reiterate, this is far beyond any real world scenario you would run into while you're running the CPU and this cooler. This should be considered more of a testament to the cooling performance as this just isn't something that you're gonna run into. I'm quite happy with this result as the lesser coolers typically cannot run this test without massive thermal throttling or even thermal shutdowns in the case of the stock cooler. I wasn't even able to complete a 10 minute run. During this test, I saw the average core speed right around 3.9 gigahertz with dips and highs in the range of 25 to 50 megahertz. Well, I do believe the 3D Mark testing was roughly what you should expect during the average gaming workload, I wanted to test at least one game, so I picked the still popular GTA 5. The testing during the built-in benchmark was quite reliable and repeatable. The average CPU temps were roughly 50 to 51 C, with a range of 1 to 2 degrees in either direction. The load temperatures came in right around 64 and a half degrees, also with a range of one to two C in either direction, depending on what was going on in the game. During the benchmark and normal gameplay, I was regularly seeing all of the cores hit 4.1 gigahertz. Sometimes some of the cores were even hitting 4.125, which was definitely nice to see on the CPU. Unlike the 3600X or the other higher end CPUs, it is rare to see this CPU boost even that close to 4.2, which is the theoretical max. Maximum. As for my overall thoughts on the FUMA 2 cooler by Scythe, I really like the performance per dollar ratio here. This appears to be a great bang for the buck in the $50 to $60 dollar range, and I would definitely consider purchasing this even over the Mugen 5 cooler, as long as I had the money in the build to do it. In terms of pricing, this is quite aggressive against many other dual power coolers in the range. The FUMA 2 provided great temperatures during pretty much all of the tests that basically allowed the Ryzen 3600 to boost as high as 4.125 GHz during gaming and as high as 3.9 GHz during extreme CPU tests like Prime 95 of a small FFT. While the cooler and the fans were working hard to cool the CPU, even with the fans at 100% speed, the cooler was still basically whisper quiet, which is definitely something I've come to appreciate. The fans are rated at 24.9 dBA and 23.9 dBA for the larger and the smaller model. This helps make the gaming experience that much better by keeping the noise from the system to a minimum. Since the FUMA 2 cooler comes in at an MSRP of $59.99 and can even be had lower during sales, I would absolutely recommend this cooler to anyone looking for an air cooler in the $50 to $60 range. In terms of the cooling performance for that range, the FUMA 2 is definitely one of the best options. If you're interested in buying a FUMA 2 cooler, check out the description below. I will link where you can get one, as well as all the other parts featured in this test build. If you're interested in other gaming component, computer, and server build reviews, as well as some networking content in the near future, get subscribed to the channel and click the bell icon below this video so that you get email updates every time a video is released. You can follow me on YouTube by subscribing, on Twitter, at Sam's Tech Stuff, as well as on Facebook, at facebook.com forward slash samstechstuff or by checking out the website samstechstuff.com.